Today, really, we're, we're going to examine Christian stewardship. Well, throughout our service, we'll have readings that encourage us to consider the gifts that God has given us. And with us, we also have Pastor Paul Lindhorst, who is one of our planned uh, giving uh, counselors for our area of our district uh, in the Wells as well, too. So we're glad that he's here sharing God's word with us. I actually know him a little bit because we were out in South Dakota together. When I was in Akaska and Mount City, he was serving for a mission advancement for uh, Great Plains Luther High School at that time. So it's good to see him again now that we're both in the, in the same district once again. But we'll be following the order of service that you have in your worship folder. This Sunday, we'll be having uh, three baptisms in our late service for three sisters of, of, our, of our school. And so we'll be, in all of our services, examining the blessings of baptism in our opening. So we have our opening hymn, Baptize into your name most holy. We'll sing the first three stanzas. May the Lord bless our worship. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. In baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives 
when we recite these words, Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit and united us to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Every day, God forgives your sins. He removes your guilt and strengthens you to defeat Satan's power. His promise is for you and for your children, and he will never forsake you. Your sins are forgiven. You are clothed with Christ. You are at peace with God, now and forever. Please stand for prayer. We give thanks, most merciful Father, that you will receive Bella, Nora, and Sophia as your own children, and you will make them members of Christ's body, the church. Now we pray, grant to them and to all of your church on earth that being dead to sin, we may live to righteousness and being buried with Christ into his death, we may also share in his resurrection so that with all your saints we may inherit eternal life through Christ our Lord, you may take your seats for the hymn verse, baptized into your name most holy. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, for our sakes you became poor, so that we through your poverty might become rich. Freely we have received from you. Help us to freely give, that in so doing we might show our thanks to you and help in your work. You live and you reign now and forever. Amen. We continue with our first reading from Malachi chapter 3. Here the Old Testament Israelites are reminded that they have neglected their required offerings to the Lord. And the Lord challenges them to give and to see how he would take care of them. Malachi chapter 3. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land 
says the Lord Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our psalm today. Please take note that our cantor will sing the refrain once through, and then we'll join in singing the refrain. Our cantor will also sing the verses as a solo, and we'll join in the remaining refrains. Our second reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where we are reminded that in giving to others, we have opportunity to reflect the love of Christ. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand in honor of the words of our Savior in the gospel lesson as we join in singing the gospel acclamation.
Our Gospel reading from Luke chapter 21. Here, Christ highlights the generosity of faith that he sees in a poor widow who gives all that she has. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. You may take your seats as we continue with our hymn of the day. 749, God who is giving knows no end. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours and mine alone in Christ Jesus, who is our only Savior and our only Lord. Amen. Our text for this evening is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 33. It's, it's a part of a larger section of scripture that we all know very, very well. So I'm just going to introduce it for these first three verses, and we'll touch upon the remainder of the verses as we go through the sermon. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. Dear ones, at the time of the Apostle Peter, shortly after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, the Apostle Peter talked about one of the most important events in the history of the world, that is, the end of time, the end of this world. Now, Jesus also makes it very plain that he's going to be coming back to this earth a second time as well. And we know that day very well to be what day? To be Judgment Day, right? Every man, woman, and child who has ever lived will stand before the judge, the throne of God. And that means that you and I will also stand before the Almighty Judge. And so the big question that we want to answer on that day, and as we prepare for that day, every single day, is this one. What will you say to Jesus on Judgment Day? It's kind of an interesting question, isn't it? Intriguing question. An extremely important question. In our text, Jesus describes the judgment scene, arguably in no more clear language than you find in all of Scripture. We see the believers as sheep who are placed on Jesus' right-hand side. And then we see the unbelievers who are described as goats who are placed on Jesus' left-hand side. The terror of the judgment is emphasized in these particular words of Jesus to the unbelievers when he says this, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Now, what's Jesus doing to these folks? Well, he, he's scolding them, to be sure, right? But even more horrendously, the fact is he is condemning these people. And why? He's condemning them because of their lack of good works. Now we as good, faithful, God-fearing Lutherans, Wells Lutherans, recognize that in one month from right now, we're going to be having a worship service in which we emphasize once again that we are not saved by our works. We are saved only by what God has done for us in the Son whom he loves, whom he punished in our place, right? And through faith in him. And yet here, Jesus condemns them because of their lack of good works. The things that you ought to have done, you did not do. And you didn't do it for me either, as a result. And so the unbelievers, well, the Bible very clearly says this. Let's start out with that. Without faith, faith in who? In faith in what? It doesn't specifically state here, but in the context of, the, of this verse, it very clearly shows us that without faith in this Jesus, whom God the Father punished on our behalf, the innocent for the guilty, so that we might come to God by faith in him and live with Jesus forever in heaven, Without faith in this Jesus, who is the Savior of the world, it is impossible to please God. And so the unbeliever's lack of faith, or lack of good works in the eyes of God, are proof of their lack of faith in Jesus Christ as their one and only Savior and Lord. Now, to the believers comes Jesus' wonderful invitation into his heavenly kingdom when he says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. You see, the good works of the believers, which are listed elsewhere in this very same chapter of Matthew 25, are clear evidence of the fact, in God's eyes, of their living faith in Jesus Christ as their only Savior from sin, as their only way to heaven. Now, what all of this means is that when it comes to where you and I will spend our eternity, that's it. There's either a right or a left. That's all. There is no fence to ride. There is no in-between. It's either one side or the other, period. 
And that brings us to us. What will each of you say to Jesus on Judgment Day? Well, for the bulk of the remainder of today's sermon, what I'd like to do is something a little bit different. I'd like you to imagine that you're standing in line waiting to be admitted or waiting to, 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 be, uh, to have a conversation with Jesus uh, as far as why he should let you into his heaven. Right? To be interviewed by him for that reason. Now, there are plenty of people ahead of you so you'll have a chance to think about what it is that you're going to say. In fact, I'm encouraging you to eavesdrop. Most of the time we say, don't eavesdrop. Okay. Here I'm going to encourage you to eavesdrop. And I want you to listen to what the people are saying. And I also want you to listen in what Jesus says to what these people are saying as well. Because the reasons they give for why Jesus should let them into his heaven. All right, listen to what they're saying. You ready? Here we go. First person steps up and says, Jesus, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't one of your followers. But you know, I never really had a chance to believe in you. You see, my parents never took me to church or Sunday school. They never told me about you, and so I never really had a chance to believe in you. And Jesus replies, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You have Moses and the prophets. You have the entire Bible. You have the natural knowledge of God, the law of God written in your hearts and in your minds. You could have, you know, searched for and used my word and found me and learned about me. But you didn't think I was worth it. So now, and for all eternity, you are worth nothing to me. Next person steps up and says, Lord, you know that Sunday was the one day out of the week that I could do some work around the house. You know? Uh, I mean, you, you, you told me that I was supposed to take good care of the things that you gave to me. I was supposed to be a good steward. Uh, the pastor talked about being good stewards of the things that, uh, that, that you gave to me, and I know you want that. And so I, 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 you know how busy I was during the, the work week, and so I'm sorry if I offended you, Lord, but I just didn't have the time. And Jesus says, depart from me, you who are cursed. If you had truly loved me, then you would have found the time just like you did for hunting and fishing and camping and golfing and attending your kids' games and, sh and shopping and da 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 whatever else you want to add to that phrase. You say that you had no time for me. Well, never again will I have time for you. Depart from me. Mine's getting a little shorter. Thinking about what you're going to say. Next person moves up. Lord, I, I know that I didn't often make it to church, but hey, hey Lord, I, I was a member. I mean, you can check it out. My name's written in the church directory. And Jesus says, your name may be written in the books at church, but your name is not written in my book of life. Therefore, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Next person moves up and says, Lord, I'm sorry, too, that I wasn't always in church, but, you know, I, I always did send in my contribution. I always paid my church dues. And again, Jesus says, depart from me, you who are cursed. I didn't want your money. Didn't want your money. Didn't need your money to get the things done that I wanted to get done. What I wanted was your heart. What I wanted was you. You. And now your money will perish with you. Next person steps up, speaks. Lord, you know that I've tried to be the kind of person that you want me to be. I mean, I have really, really tried. 
I mean, I've given more than my fair share to the United Way. You know, I've, I've, I've tried to help those who are less fortunate than me. I've read my Bible almost every single day. I, I sent my children to our Lutheran elementary school and, and Sunday school and catechism classes. I also know that I sin many times. And, you know, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed about some of the things that I've done. I'm even ashamed, too ashamed to admit them. But I tried. Doesn't that count for something? And Jesus says, in my book, trying hard counts for nothing. Because in my book, you must be perfect, just as my Father in heaven is perfect. So it doesn't matter how hard you tried, you were not perfect as God demanded that you be. Therefore, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And finally, there's only one person ahead of you. You're next give your answer to Jesus on Judgment Day. The last person in line before he steps up and says, Lord, I know that I have fallen many, many, many times. But I also know, I know because the Bible says so, that you died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. And Jesus says, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It isn't enough to simply know about my death. The devils know these truths. And, and, and what do they do with them? They tremble at them. You didn't know me with your heart. By faith. And so now I declare, and for now and all eternity, I don't know you. your turn. Your turn to stand before Jesus, the Almighty Judge of heaven and earth. What will you say? I mean, as you've seen all the excuses that people have brought before Jesus as to why they were not and why Jesus should all those excuses have failed. All the good works that people have brought before the Lord Jesus during this time of ex examination and interview process, and these things have crumbled into the dust before the judge. He's looked into the hearts of every single person who stood before him. The good that you thought that you had done has passed away so that you now stand spiritually naked before the judgment throne of God. What will you say? My prayer, God grant, that on that day, each and every one of us may say something along these lines to Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. It isn't anything that I could have done. It's only what you have done for me, Jesus, my Savior. It's the sinless blood that you shed on the cross that has covered up all of my sins and paid my debt. What I couldn't do, you and you alone have done for me and everyone else in the whole world by your life and your death and your resurrection. You paid the price that God demanded be paid for my sin with your holy, precious blood. And it's only by the grace of God that I even stand here or am on my knees before you, trusting that you have done everything that needs to be done for my salvation. Only because of you and your gracious love do I trust in you as my Savior. And then the judge will answer, you are right. My dear brother or sister, how can I refuse you? Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. At the 
outset of the worship service this evening, pastor said that this was a kind of a ministry of Christian giving Sunday, a Christian stewardship Sunday. Now, I would imagine that this sermon that you just heard, at least to this point, is probably not the type of sermon that you were anticipating tonight. And yet, when it comes to us, when it comes to our salvation, who always needs to be at the front and the center of everything? It's Jesus. Many of the people who came to Jesus were interviewed by Jesus for admission into heaven. They thought it was about them, right? Themselves, not about Jesus. And yet by the grace of God, you and I recognize that it is all about Jesus. Because we cannot get ourselves to heaven by the things that we think or say or do. We've blown it. We cannot get ourselves to heaven. It's all about Jesus. And that's true of everything in our lives. Everything needs to center and focus on Jesus. If it isn't centered and focused on Jesus, it's centered and focused in the wrong place, in the wrong faith. We, our lives, our eternities are focused on Jesus. And they must remain focused on Jesus. Praise be to God. That when it comes to our salvation, it is all about Jesus. And that Jesus has done it all. And simply by trusting in what he has done, we receive the benefits of and enjoy the benefits of all that Jesus has done. When it comes to offering our gifts, when it comes to offering our lives, when it comes to doing and everything that we do in this world, as husbands and wives, as sons and daughters, as children, as as as, as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We want everything that we do to be focused on what Jesus has done for us first. Jesus is the reason why we do what we do. In thankfulness and love for him who first loved us. Right? Remember when Jesus said to the unbelievers, he said, you know, all the things that I would have wanted you to have done for me that, that you didn't do, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. Through Jesus and through Jesus' salvation, when Jesus looks at us now, he sees us as being those, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me and I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you came to visit me and looked after me. And on that day, we will find ourselves saying, when did we do these things for you, Lord? When? We never saw you. We saw a picture of you or a representation. We never saw you, Lord Jesus. But Jesus says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you have done for me. That's why we do what we do. To honor him. To glorify him. To praise him, to thank him who gave himself up for us. I could go on and talk a lot more about this. That's the stuff for other sermons that your pastors will talk to you about in the weeks and the months and the years to come. Let's close things off this, this evening by, by going back to the initial thoughts that we had as you stand before the judgment throne of God. And Jesus asked you the question, why should I let you into my heaven? What will you say? Make it all about Jesus. Make it all about you. Amen? Amen. Please rise as we join now in uh, confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 10 in your service folders. We believe, Father of the Almighty, maker of the heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And please be seated. In our prayers of the church, we want to remember the three girls who will be baptized this coming Sunday, Bella, Nora, and Sophia. We also want to keep in our prayers Jason and Amy Bowers as they celebrate their sixth anniversary. And we also want to pray for all those who are suffering the effects of Hurricane Ian. We approach the Lord's throne of grace. Lord God, from whom all blessings flow, we praise you for everything that you provide to sustain our lives. Lead us every day to be thankful for your gifts and with what you have given. Today we pray that you would guide us to manage your blessings wisely for the good of your kingdom. As we use your gifts to meet our needs, move us also to support the ministry of the gospel with our offerings. Before your Son ascended to your throne, he called us to preach the good news to every creature. In grace, you have created public ministry so that we may answer his call to others in our place. Impress on us the immense importance of the task within us to proclaim your word to the world. In our words and in our offerings, move us to be faithful witnesses of your grace. Work in our hearts so that our gifts do more than support a cause or meet a need. Move us to give out of love for you, our King and our Redeemer. Yes, to bring our gifts first to honor you, the giver of all things. Teach us to give as an ongoing part of life since the work of the gospel continues every day. Forgive us for the sins of apathy and carelessness and for giving that reacts only to urgent pleas or crises. crises. Teach us to, ter to determine our offerings in view of your blessings to us. The widow's coins were meager, but they were all she had. Move us to believe that to whom much is given, much is it also expected. Teach us to give our offerings as, as a cheerful response of faith in you and your Son. Spare us all feelings of obligation or resentment as we give. Help us to see our offerings as the vehicle that carries the gospel to the lost and lead us to rejoice with the angels of heaven over every sinner who repents. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of marriage that you have given to Jason and Amy Bowers. Be with them as they celebrate their sixth anniversary and give them many more happy years together. We also rejoice in the gift of faith that you will give to Bella, Nora, and Sophia as they are brought to the font this coming Sunday. And your Holy Spirit is placed on them, and they receive, with the water and the word, faith and trust in you. We also ask that you continue to be with all those who are suffering the effects of Hurricane Ian. Be with those who are still feeling the effects. Be with all those who are recovering after the storm has passed. Make it so that help is received, and that the recovery is swift. And hear us, Lord, 
as we pray in silence. Precious Lord, all our blessings come from you. Lead us again and again to thank you, and then move us to be wise and faithful stewards of your gifts. May our gifts and our offerings bring souls here and far away to the gracious gift of Jesus and his love. Lord, hear us and grant us this blessing. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. You may take your seats as we conclude with the hymn, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Gladly. Him 748.